last time I introduced you to the fundamental force law of magnetism. The answer to the question of if I have a charge here, Q, moving with velocity V in this direction, what magnetic field does this charge produce at this location? And the answer given here, we walked through last time, the magnetic field is proportional to the, how much charge there is Q, it, and it depends on the velocity, and it depends on R hat, but the way it does so is V cross R hat. So in particular, it depends not only on the magnitude of V, but the direction of V. For example, if this charged particle were moving this way, then the sign of the magnetic field would flip, and instead of um, coming, pointing from you towards me, it would be pointing from me towards you. Um, now, uh, the, distant, the, the, the other thing which the V cross R hat does is it sets up the pattern in space of how the, the, the direction and the strength of the field vary. So the field um, on this side over here is going from me towards you. On this side over here, it's coming out from you towards me, coming from me, you towards me. Um, and its magnitude at a given distance r is greater over here. It gets less, it gets less. All of this we talked through last time. Now, to take this force law and put it into the form that is named after two French physicists, Biot and Savart, um, we need to ask not just about one little charge moving, we need to ask about current in a wire. So if you start to think about a wire with current flowing down it, there's lots of bits of charge in this wire. They're all moving in this direction. In other words, I have a current I. And I think about each of these little bits of charge Q, each of them makes a magnetic field according to this force law. And now I use superposition. I vector add all the magnetic field produced by all the little bits of charge that together make up this current. And when I do that, I'm going to get a magnetic field which looks as shown in this diagram here. The magnetic field curls around the wire and it does so according to a right hand rule. If I take the thumb of my right hand and send it down the direction of the current, the direction of the magnetic field is the direction in which my fingers curl. So the, the, the um, magnetic field curls around the wire like this. That is inherited from the force law over here where if I had taken my thumb along the direction of the velocity, the direction of the magnetic field curls around that velocity vector as we discussed last time. So if we compare and contrast um, the electric force to the magnetic force, if I imagine that instead of carrying a current, this was, um, had a charge density along this wire, then it would be a source of electric field. If I had a bunch of charge along a, a wire like this, then it's a source of electric field, and the electric field points radially outward. It points away from the wire, or it points radially inward. It points towards the wire. It doesn't point around the wire. Once I have a current running through the wire, instead of asking, given a charge here, what electric field does it make? I ask, given a current here, given moving charge here, what magnetic field does it make? I get the answer that we've shown here, which looks, that looks quite different. The vectors are pointing in a different direction. And this difference in the direction is really the essence of the difference between magnetic forces and electric forces. So what we want to consider now is a wire. And it might be straight, like the one in this diagram here. But I, I, the way I draw it on the board now, I don't want to assume that the wire is straight. So here's a wire. And it's carrying some current I. And in this wire, there are lots of little bits of charge. And let's focus on one little bit of charge here, which I will label dq. Here's my dq. There's a little bit of charge right here, um, dq. And this charge is moving. It's moving with some velocity in this direction. Um, this velocity we've been calling v, but I'm going to call this velocity, I'm going to break this velocity down v, and I'm going to call v ds dt, s being a position vector. And so um, if I pick a point, where's my point p going to be? Let's say I pick some point up here. Here's my point p. Um, and I ask, what is the magnetic field at this point p? 
Well, this magnetic field is going to be an, a sum over lots of little dBs. There will be a dB produced here by this dQ, and there will be a dB produced, produced at this point P by this dQ over here, and there will be a dB produced at this point here, uh, at this point P by this DQ over here. There's a DQ that's moving this way here. There's a DQ that's moving this way here. Each of these little DQs is going to make a dB at this point, and then we're going to have to add up all the dBs to get the actual magnetic field at the point P. So what is our dB? Well, let's focus on this DQ that we started with. Um, so here's my dB. Well, what's it going to be proportional to? Um, Given what we saw before, dB is going to be proportional to dQ. Remember that for the fundamental force law that we had before, the magnetic field of the point P was proportional to the, the, the source of charge, and the source of charge here for us is this dQ. And then it's going to be proportional to V. We're writing V as dS dt. So that's this dS dt right here, cross r hat. And what's r hat? Well, r hat is um, the unit vector pointing from this dq in the direction of the point P where I'm working out the magnetic field. So if I was talking about this dq, I'd have an r hat that was pointing from here towards P. When I'm talking about this dq, I have an r hat that's pointing there. For this dq, the ds dt vector points this way. For this dq, the ds dt vector points this way, the r hat vector points this way. In this particular case, for this dq, ds dt points this way, and r hat points this way. And this is my expression, or at least the, the beginnings of my expression, for the dB, the, the, the little bit of magnetic field caused by this little bit of charge. This little bit of moving charge, what magnetic field does it produce there? That's this dB. Okay, and now I play a standard physicist's trick, and it's the same physicist's trick that we used previously when we talked about the force on a current carrying wire. And I'm going to do it with my eraser here. I'm going to take this dt, and I'm going to move it, over, move it here. So I move the dt from under the ds to under the dq. And why did I do that? Well, I did that because dq dt is the current i. So, the conclusion that I reach is that dB is proportional to I times dS vector cross R hat. So I have now, the way I'm thinking about this is I have a little segment of the wire right here. I'll do it in red. Here's my little segment of the wire right here. This is my ds vector. And there's a current flowing through this wire, and that current is i. That i is in front here. And then I have this ds vector crossed with the r hat vector. And we're almost done. To finish this, to make this into an equality, I just remember the other bits of the fundamental force law that I didn't um, yet write down. So if I want to make this an equality, I need to have a mu naught over 4 pi and I need to have a 1 over r squared, where r is this distance here. It's the distance from this point here to this point here. Um, and this is called the Biot-Savart law. In English, Biot-Savart. In French, Biot-Savart named after two um, 19th century physicists who um, were among the early pioneers of electromagnetism. Um, so what we'll then need to do if we want to work out the um, mathematical result for the current around a wire like this is here's my expression dB. And um, I need to add, if I want to know what the magnetic field is at this point here, I have to add up all the little dBs from this section ds, 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 this section ds. When I add them all up, the magnetic field that I get there will be the one shown by the, by the, blue, um, the blue vector. And it will, the direction is easy to work out if I have a straight wire like this. The direction is easy to work out because 
all of these, these ds cross r hats point in the same direction. And um, they do, they, the direction they point in is obtained from the right hand rule. Um, I take with the thumb of my right hand and then I curl my fingers and that tells me the direction of the db. Um, in fact, it tells me the direction of all the dbs. Doing the math of adding up the dbs is something we'll do um, in a future video. But um, uh, this then is the essence of how moving charges, which is to say current in wires, make magnetic fields. And um, everything that we're going to do in the next section of um, 802 is built on this plus superposition plus one more little fact that we haven't emphasized yet, but that we're about to get. So we define the Bios of our law abstractly as equal, the B field at some point was a constant mu naught over four pi times the integral over the source of I ds cross some unit vector r hat over r squared. Now, right away, um, lots of people see this r hat and think, are we in spherical coordinates? Are we in cylindrical coordinates? This is an abstract r hat. It was the same type of thing we had in Coulomb's law. It's the unit vector that goes from our source ds to the field point p. And this is a distance from the source to the field point. Now, most of the time, nobody ever writes those indices there. But it does distinguish this from unit vectors in particular coordinate systems. Now, one of the things with this abstract law is we want to look at how to apply it for a very specific case. So let's consider the following source. We have a circular current. Somehow, current is coming in and going out. And we have a current flowing I. And I want to find the magnetic field at the center. So the way I do this is I'm going to first choose a vector ds. Now, the direction of ds is in the direction of the current. So I'll pick an arbitrary place here and write a ds as a vector. So I'm setting up first a diagram to show what these abstract objects are. And the unit vector r hat dsp is the unit vector that goes from ds, and it's located at p, because that's where we're trying to find the magnetic field. And this is our r hat dsp. And now I want to calculate this in a coordinate system. So because we have a central point P, the natural coordinate system is polar. And so we have our r hat theta hat dot k hat. And now I can write down these vectors. So the next step is to write down the ds. And our ds vector is here if we have a radius r and some angle d theta then the ds is r d theta theta hat. Now here's where the distinguishing between this and our unit vector and polar coordinates comes in. Notice that this vector is opposite r hat. And so the r hat dsp, it's not the unit vector and polar coordinates, it's minus r hat. And once we've done that, the distance here, the we can just write that out too, it's pretty clear that this is just the radius of the circle. From ds to p is the radius of the circle. And now I can compute b of p. My integration variable here is d theta. So that's our integration variable. Let's make a note of that. And b of p at the center is mu naught i. Integrating theta goes from 0. We're going all the way around the circle. I, R, D theta, theta hat, cross minus R hat over R squared. And the R is constant as we go around the circle. And the remember in our coordinate system, R hat cross theta hat is K hat. Here, we have 
theta hat cross r hat, which is minus k hat, but the extra minus sign indicates that it's plus k hat. One of the r's cancel, and we get mu naught i 4 pi r comes outside. Integral d theta from 0 to 2 pi k hat. And that's just 2 pi. 2 pi over 4 pi is a half. And we get the result that mu naught i over 2 r k hat is the magnetic field at the center. So our B field is in the k hat direction. We would now like to apply the BO sub r to a variety of different current carrying wires and calculate the magnetic field associated with them. Let's recall that the BO sub r law in its abstract form says that the magnetic field at a field point is equal to the integral of mu naught over 4 pi, the integral over the source of the current element, I ds, cross a unit vector from the source element to the field point, divided by the distance dsp to the field point squared. And you'll notice that in, in this law, there's a lot of similarities to our Coulomb law for continuous charge distributions. We have the cross product. We have a different source element. Now, let's consider a portion of a wire. So we'll draw a picture like this. We'll have a wire with a current, I. And now let's just take this wire to be of length L. And let's imagine that somewhere the wire has some type of power supply that's producing the current that goes around it. And I just want to consider the effect of this straight part of the wire at some field point P, which I'll draw over here. And I want to know what is the B field at this field point. Well, what's important to begin the analysis is to choose a good coordinate system. So the way I'll do that is I'll draw my wire. I'll pick some type of origin, and I'll pick it coordinate system at the center of the wire. I'll have unit vectors i hat, j hat, and I'll choose a right-handed system k hat with k hat in that as direction shown. And I'll put my field point p right here, and I'll give it coordinates x and y. And now this is my finite wire. And what I want to do is pick a source element in this wire here. I'll exaggerate its size. And this is my i ds. And now the crucial thing is to, in this coordinate system, to choose a integration variable. So I'm going to call this my x prime. And I want to draw the distance. That's our r ds to the field point. And that unit vector points out. And this is enough. Uh, we just still have to relate the, the length of our source to our integration variable. So we have a dx prime. Now, there's still one thing to keep in mind, that we have a unit vector here. And when we do the integral, we're going to be adding up a lot of pieces. And you can see both the direction and the distance to the field point will depend on what source element we are. And in order to express these two quantities in our coordinate system, we can do the following thing. Let's draw a vector vector r prime, vector r. And the key vector that we want, r minus r prime, the length of that vector, r minus r prime, is precisely equal to the r from our source element to the field point. And the unit vector that we want from the source vector to the field point is r minus r prime over the magnitude. Now, these two vectors are easy to see. The vector r is to the field point, so we write it in Cartesian coordinates. 
and the vector r prime is to the infinitesimal current source, and that's equal to x prime i hat. And so it's a trivial matter, well, not trivial, but it's just vector subtraction to write this unit vector as x minus x prime i hat plus y j hat. That represents r minus r prime, and we use the Pythagorean theorem to get its length, y squared to the 1 half. Um, now, you could have done all of this just with with Pythagorean theorem and vector decomposition, this is another nice way to do it. And so now we can write down the magnetic field. And now I'm introducing very explicitly the field coordinates, x and y. This is in the plane. It's equal to the integral. Well, our integration variable is going from minus L to x prime equals L over 2. And so the limits over this small section of the wire is given by that. And now we have the constant mu naught over 4 pi. We have i dx prime i hat cross the r hat, which is x minus x prime i hat plus y j hat. And downstairs, we have 3 to the 3 halves power, because there's a squared there, so this is x minus x prime squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. Now, one of the things that we see immediately is that we don't have to, when we take this cross product in our coordinate system, i hat cross j hat is k hat. And of course, i hat cross i hat is 0. And so the only piece that comes in here is the i hat cross j hat. And so we get this is equal to x prime equals minus l over 2 a little tedious to write this out. Mu naught i over 4 pi dx prime over x minus x prime squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. Now remember, the integration variable this is in the k hat direction. I haven't forgotten my y yet. But the integration variable is x prime. So the y is not being integrated over. And so you see we have a few constants. Now, this integral is equal to, um, so we need an integration formula. And our integration formula, I'll put over here, dx prime over x minus x prime squared plus y squared 3 halves. This is equal to minus x minus x prime over x minus x prime squared plus y squared to the 1 half, and I have to divide by 1 over y squared. Um, you can try this yourself by differentiating this quantity. And so what we get is minus mu naught i over 4 pi. Now notice there's a y up here and a y squared downstairs, so I have a y down there. And I have in here um, x minus l over 2 over the denominator, which is x minus l over 2 squared plus y squared. We're running out of room to the 1 half minus this minus sign is out there. So it's x minus minus l over 2. So that's plus l over 2 over x plus l over 2 squared plus y squared to 3 halves to the 1 half. And there we have it. Now, this is a mess, but you can see what's a very nice exercise to do is to look at b x y in the limit as this little length of the wire goes to infinity. So we're talking about a very long wire. Now, I'm going to do this by pointing out these terms. When we look at this limit, l goes to infinity, l is much, much bigger than x. So in the numerator here, we can ignore the x. We can ignore the x here. Um, and so we just have minus L over 2 minus another L over 2. And that's going to give a plus sign on the outside with an L. In the denominator, we can ignore the x. We can ignore the y, too. We're assuming it's much bigger than x and y. 
And the denominator is just L over 2 squared to the square root. So that brings a factor 2 upstairs. And in this limit um, of our big result, what we get, by the way, I did include that this is pointing in the k-hat direction. The limit becomes the 2's come upstairs, cancel that. The minus sign comes out. The L upstairs cancels the L downstairs. And we get this nice, very simple result, u naught i over 2 pi y in the k-hat direction. And that's the field. This expression, we have to be a little bit careful because we calculated it in the positive plane. This is for y bigger than 0. But if y is less than 0, it also holds because then the direction would be negative k-hat. And that's downstairs. So in fact, our result is good. Um, whether it's above or below the plane, what we have to be careful about here is y is not equal to 0. So there's the magnetic field of a wire that's both finite in length and also the limit as the length of the wire goes to infinity using the Beals of our law. What we'd like to do is consider the force on a current carrying wire in a magnetic field. And what we'd like to begin with is our idea, let's draw a little wire here. Let's identify some charges in the wire. And here, we'll call the charge in this area dq. And all of these charges are moving with v. And let's say that this wire is placed in an external magnetic field. And what we'd like to do is calculate the force on the whole wire. Now, we know from our force law that the forces on moving charges, dq, v, cross, b, external. So that's our force. And what we'd like to do is look at this expression, dq, v. Well, the velocity of the charge, um, we can introduce a vector. And here, let's assume that our current is going this way. So what we're imagining is that positive charges are moving in that direction. Then this is just dq times ds over dt, which I can write as dq dt times ds, or that's i ds. And this quantity, dqv or i ds, we're going to refer to as our infinitesimal current source or current element, in this case, our current element. And we can then write down our force law on that element as I ds cross the external magnetic field. Now, when we want to get the total force on the wire, then this is the magnetic force. We have to integrate over the wire of I ds cross b, external. And let's look at a few special cases. So our first case is where b external is a uniform field. A uniform field means that the vectors everywhere are pointing in the same direction and have the same magnitude. So our wire could look like complicated shape, but everywhere in space, the B field is uniform. Then, in this integral, every little ds is being crossed with this B field. What we can do is pull the, D the B field out of the integral, because every element has the same B field that it's crossing with, and this becomes our Beal savar I mean, our force law. Now, the second case is a straight wire. So here, we can write our everywhere in this wire, for every single element, the ds vectors are in the same direction. And when we do this, this is a straight wire in a uniform field. We can draw a whole vector if the current is going this way. 
from one end of the wire to the other, L. And when you do this integral, all you're doing is adding up all these, these small little pieces, and that gives us the total vector L. So this force on a straight wire in a uniform field is simply I vector L cross B external. Now, in both cases, we have to be careful that the direction of L is the direction of I, and the direction of ds is also the direction of I. So what we're saying in here is that I is a signed quantity, and we have to be careful about that. And we'll see in some examples how that works out. Now, the third example, um, and I'll put that one over here, is suppose we have a current loop in a uniform field. So here's our current loop, and we have our I, and whatever the field is, B, it's uniform, then we're doing this integral F equals the integral over the closed loop of, I'm going to pull the I out ds, and the whole thing is across the external field. Now, what's interesting about this vector sum, and just as a simple example, if we look at a circle and you add up all the ds's in a circle, then the sum over the circle of this vector sum is zero. And this is true not just for a circle, but for an arbitrary shape, that when you inter add up the ds's, you're basically going in this direction one way, and then you're going back that direction, and in the vertical direction, you're going this way, and then you're coming back, and so this sum is zero. So the force, and I'll take a peek right through here, the force through a current loop in a uniform field is zero. Let's calculate the magnetic field due to a certain configuration of wires. Here, we're going to have a current running through a semicircle of wire, and the wire goes up like this, another semicircle like that, and so we have current running like this. The geometry here is R1 over R2. Now, for a ring, we calculated that the magnetic field at the center of a ring was mu naught i over 2 radius of the ring, and by the right-hand rule, gave us a direction perpendicular to the plane of that current loop. And why was this factor 2 here? Because if you went back and looked at it, we were integrating d theta prime from 0 to 2 pi, and that gave us a factor of 2 pi. But in this example, for either of these legs, we're only going to go through a half a circle, so our field will be down by a factor of 2. And so what we have is that the total field, so what we can say here, let's just make a point about that, the field of half a ring at the center is mu naught i over 4r k hat where r is the radius of the ring. So now, what we have to do is be a little bit careful. Let's choose a coordinate system in which um, here we'll have k hat pointing like that. And you can see that the, each of these half loops are producing B field in our direction of k hat. And so we have two half rings. So we have mu naught i over 4 r1 k hat plus mu naught i over 4 r2 k hat. And if you were calculating for a different fraction of an arc, you would have a corresponding change in factors. And now, what about these two legs? I'll claim that the field on those legs are 0. And that raises a very interesting point about those cases. Let's look at it this way. Suppose we have a straight wire and we have a little element ds. And I want to choose a field point p that is along this line. 
Now, the B field for any point along this line coming from this source will be zero. And the reason is, is that if we look at the contribution, recall that is our constant mu naught, four pi, I ds, cross that unit vector that goes from our source element to the field point. And so that's R dsp, and we divide by that distance squared. Now, you can see in this example that the ds vector and the r hat vector are in the same direction when we're along that line. And so ds cross r hat dsp is 0. Two parallel vectors have 0 cross product. And so any point along the line in which the direction of the current is pointing is, gives you 0 contribution. And when we look at these two legs here and there, this point is along those lines. And so in both those legs, we have zero contributions. And I can write it like that. And so here is the magnetic field at the center of the wire of this configuration of wire and current.